Hello out there, my name is Sarah Vertigo. In this channel, I'm going to go into the story of Galarian, including its history, deities, nations, and its civilizations. This is mainly an excuse for me to be able to use my knowledge of Pathfinder and its main settings, but I also will hopefully help me pick up some new info for each and every topic that is available for the world of Galarian. Today, we're going to discuss the Earthfall, a nearly world-ending event that happened way back in negative 5293 AR. The current year, as of February 2021, is 4721 AR, meaning this took place over 10,000 years ago. And I can hear what you're saying, and I agree. How is this possibly relevant to current day Galarian? Well, I'm about to tell you. Earthfall is one of the earliest events that we know of in Galarian history, and is quite possibly one of the largest events in history, truly affecting the surface on a global scale. This video is only going to be discussing the events of Earthfall, and we will leave a civilization deep dive for a later video. With that said, expect a bare bones mentioning of anything not directly important to the Earthfall event itself. To set the stage a little bit, let's explore how Galarian was before Earthfall. Galarian's main civilizations at this time were the human empires of Aslant and Thassalon. There are others, but we're just going to mention the important ones. We will mainly be talking about Aslan in this video because Thassalon was formed with exiles of Aslan due to differing opinions on how they should interact with the other races and civilizations of Galarian at the time, so they will have their own video later. Long story short, the difference between Thassalon and Aslan is the Aslan were incredibly racist, and Thassalon believed they could embrace the dwarves and elves and make an even better civilization. Aslan disagreed, and exiled a mass amount of Thassalons. Now, back to the Aslanic people. The Aslan people were amazingly advanced, having unlocked secrets of science and technology that even 10,000 years later still have not been fully rediscovered. The main thing to keep in mind, however, is the Aslan people did not become so advanced on their own merit and hard work. You see, the people of Aslan were raised to their positions by a species of aberration known as the Abolith. The Abolith are a race of sea-dwelling aberrations that would draw humanoid races into their clutches using mind control and the ability to grant water breathing to force slaves to build them grand and elaborate cities under the seas of Galarian. The Abolith would use their immense mind magic to raise the people of Atlant Aslan from simple barbarians into an advanced civilization of humans that stretched across what was a large continent in the oceans east of Arcadia but west of Avistan and Garund. I wish I had better maps for this section of the tale, but info on Aslan and most other civilizations from back then are pretty sparse which should honestly be your first hint that it probably didn't turn out very well for them. For a while, the Aslanti people flourished, and the leaders of this civilization began to think themselves the greatest race on Galarian. At this point, I find a little bit of contradicting info, so I'm going to mention both. Some sources say the leaders of Aslan knew of the Avalis influence, and became convinced that they had long left their masters behind in terms of power, and that they were, uh, were unneeded, while others say the Aslan had no idea that the Avalis held a part in their culture, even up to the day the Earthfall began. So, that kind of changes how your backstory would go, depending on if they knew of the Aboliths, or if they had no idea that the Avalis were around. Which one it is, is kind of up to you, because source books go both ways. Either way, the Avalis grew angry at the Aslanti people's ego, and they demanded retribution from the race that they had lifted from savagery. Quoting the Mythic Realms Companion book on page 16, their magic reached far beyond the lands of Galarian, stretching into the depths of space to the very fringes of reality. There, in a place devoid of warmth and light, they found a body of star-born poison and metal, the drifting corpse of an unborn planet, a weapon for murdering worlds. Their power wrapped around this star-forged blade and drew it toward Galarian. Now, this is basically a large meteorite of various metals known as the Star Stone that was lassoed by the Abolith's magic and drawn to the planet's surface. 
Due to their position beneath the seas, they would remain untouched, ready to seed the planet anew with the slaves they had collected, while the surface world died. However, thanks mainly to the desperate action of two of the Aslanti deities, the Star Stone, while still destructive, was ultimately nullified. Akavna, the Aslanti goddess of battle and the moon, caught wind of the Abolith's evil plan and thrust Galarian's moon into the way of this metal mass, showering it into thousands of deadly shards. Unfortunately for Akavna, even gods can die. The Star Stone, now made up of thousands of dagger-like metal shards, plummeted toward Galarian, drawn by the Abolith's magic leaving lethal wounds on Akavna, who perished instantly. Her lover, the god Amaznin, the god of magic for the Aslanti people, was distraught by her death. In a single action, he sacrificed himself to render the magic pulling these shards to Galarian inert, slowing the meteor storm. With their sacrifice, the planet killer the Abolith had summoned while still destructive, was not the life-ending strike the Abolis had hoped for. Upon the Starstone's impact, a chain of natural disasters and volcanic eruptions took place, sending up enough dust and smog to blot out the sun for a thousand years. It's amazing to think that life could survive such an event at all, let alone grow back and flourish across its entire surface in the time since. The surface of Galarian was changed forever, and while we do not have any concrete evidence of what the world looked like before the Earthfall, we do have a few geographical changes caused by this catastrophe. For example, as described in the Inner Sea World Guide on page 32, the most important waterway in the region is the eponymous Inner Sea, yet despite its import, this region is also the youngest waterway in the area. For until Earthfall, when that strange rock known as the Starstone plunged into Galarian, the continents of Garund and Avistan were connected by a massive land bridge. The violence of Earthfall created a massive circular crater and sent shockwaves along the continental divide, collapsing much of both into ruin and allowing the waters of the Arcadian Ocean to flow east. From that section, we can determine the original map must have appeared similar to what is on screen now. And note, I'm not an artist, don't expect anything beautiful. The red highlighted area appears to have either been a large valley, or just land that was smashed into a crater by the Starstone's impact. Either way, there used to be a massive land bridge between Avistan and Garun, which the impact destroyed. Over on Tian Sha, tsunamis reshaped the continent's very coastlines. In fact, the impact was so powerful, shockwaves set off the Qinlun Mountains in a massive eruption that blotted out the sun for a thousand years, ushering in what we call the Age of Darkness. Like the Abolists wished, Earthfall was the main reason the Thassalon and Aslant civilizations were destroyed. Aslant itself, as the main target of the Abolists, was wiped nearly off the map. Instead of one continent, all that remains 10,000 years later is a series of random islands, with much of the landmass sitting at the bottom of the sea. The Aslanti people were not fully wiped off the face of the map, with Aridin, one of the last Aslanti, leading a group of survivors east to modern-day Avistan. He did his best to keep the Aslant culture alive, attempting to preserve, preserve knowledge of their amazing magical advancements, but how well he managed to do that is not entirely known. We will be going over Aridin more in depth in a later video, so I'm not going to have much more to say about him right now. Thassalon was already on its last legs, due to infighting by the seven rune lords that had seized control of the kingdom. They had long disposed of Emperor Shin, enslaving a civilization of giants and forcing them to build towering cities. With the city's coffers dry and beginning to show new untold levels of cruelty, the city was approaching its end even without the Earthfall. Like Aslant, the rune lords managed to survive the apocalypse and made various doomsday preparations so that they may live past this catastrophe. Now for a few of the lesser known civilizations. Gol Gon, 
was an ancient cyclopean civilization that covered a vast amount of land where the eye of a bendingo rests today. While the civilization started off well, over time they began resorting to cannibalism and dark god worship to bring back their once prosperous culture. While much of their civilization had already fallen apart by negative 5293, Earthfall was the final straw for them. The resulting earthquakes sank most of Golgon beneath the Arcadian Ocean, but it wasn't until 4111 AR that Chalaxian explorers discovered the ruins of Golgon, but due to their disturbing nature, the Chalaxians refused to settle there. Another Cyclops civilization by the name of Kalorod was destroyed during Earthfall, but there is much less information about this civilization. The Elves of Galarian, having received futuristic visions of the collision, had used the Sovereign Stones to leave Galarian's surface entirely, heading back to their homeworld of Sovereign through magic portals. The Elves that remained on Galarian were forced underground during the Earthfall where over thousands of years their skin darkened, while their hair faded to a dull white as the evils of the Underdark took its toll on them. They became the Drow of the Underdark, where they have lived ever since. The Dwarves of Galarian, living in Narvoth, the uppermost region of the Darklands, began their quest for sky during the Earthfall. Torag, the god of the Dwarves, told them that when the ground shook beneath their feet, they must press upward toward the surface. The impact of the Earthfall was so powerful, the Earth shook to its very core, and as foretold, the Dwarves began their march skyward. Despite leaving in negative 5293, it would take until negative 4987 AR for the race to make it to the surface, due to a mix of infighting, battles against the Orcs, and various other Underdark races, so a 300 year campaign to get from Narvoth to the surface. That sounds like a lot of fighting. The Orcs of Galarian, who also lived in Narvoth, were forced skyward as well, retreating and on the run from the Dwarven Crusade following them. Unlike the civilized Dwarves, the Orcs at this time were little more than animals, and upon realizing that pure brute strength wasn't enough, they began learning to wield abandoned dwarf weaponry and how to modify armor to fit their bulkier frames. With the knowledge of weapon craft and crafting in general, they began evolving into the race we know now. They reached the surface just before their dwarven enemies in negative 5102 and rampaged across the land in a time period that came to be known as the Sacking. Zon Kuthon, the Prince of Pain, made his return to Galarian during the Age of Darkness. Abadar, the god of culture, had grown angry at the various crimes Zon Kuthon and his followers had committed in his name, and decided to punish the god by making a bargain with him. If Zon Kuthon would go into exile in the Plain of Shadow, for as long as the sun hung in the sky, he would be allowed to pick any item of his choosing from the first vault, a legendary vault of Abadars. With the sheet of ash that blocked out the sun, Zon Kuthon caught an end to their truce and returned to the material plane. Abadar agreed that that did fulfill the terms of their agreement and allowed him to choose the first of the undead shadow from his vault. In addition to Zon Kuthon, the Starstone also brought about the arrival of Zamindor, an old god known as the Inmost Blot. The mass of rock and metal had snagged a piece of the old god, drawing him down into Galarian's surface. The Blot landed in a random lake on Galarian, where the city of Ner'zavan was formed. Eventually, the entire city was infected by the old god, and thanks to a group of heroes, the cult was eventually stopped. But, the only way to truly end this old god threat was by removing any knowledge of the entity, and thankfully, due to an untimely intervention by the legendary Tarask, all knowledge of the entity was erased from Galarian, and it stayed that way for thousands of years until Hasserton Lowell's the Fourth, a Count of Uslov, found mentions of the inmost blot in ancient text, reviving the old god. And that about wraps up most of the big things that Earthfall changed. 
Now, every nation of Galarian felt a change from the impact of Earthfall, but these were the main ones, the ones that still hit, even today, 10,000 years later. Earthfall changed the course of history and the very face of the planet. I hope I was able to teach you something new, and if I did, let me know in the comments, even if it's just to say what topic you'd like me to cover next. For my next video, I plan to finish off Ancient Times with a focus into Aradin, the last Aslant, and the God of Humanity. Then I'll talk about the civilizations of Aslant and Thassalon in the video after that, and then who knows, I, I'm not even sure what I'm going to cover next, we'll figure it out as I go. Thank you guys for watching, I really hope you enjoyed it. I know I probably butchered the pronunciation for half of these words, but I'm not a history buff. This is just stuff I've picked up reading. I've never heard it said. So if I absolutely destroy the pronunciation of something, let me know. I'll try to fix it in a future video.